today? Inspired. I don't know. We were talking about decision making um, last week, and I think I was inspired enough to watch, to binge watch all three seasons of The Boys. Um, <laughs> and just to, mm-hmm. you know, think about leverage in a way and the consequences, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> What what are the takeaways? Well, I I mean I would say, um, well, well thematically, are these virtual chalet discussions um, supposed to be philosophy uh, driven, or is it just just a hodgepodge of whatever comes up to mind? Yeah, it's a it's a bit. Uh, yeah, the the that we we talked about philosophy is because at some point we had a discussion we're like, okay, let's try philosophy, but it mm-hmm. wasn't the, yeah, most of our conversations oscillate, I think, in so many ways, Yes. which, mm-hmm. which makes it really interesting, especially when it's informal and we don't actually have a starting point, we just start with the weather and then <laughs> some, it's somewhere in quantum physics and <laughs> it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm interested. What, 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 what this what, what uh, came TV show? Mind, yeah, with, with, about the show. Yeah, yeah. Um, you haven't watched it, Kevin. Yeah, I, I, well, I'm not a regular. Um, um, I, I'm not regularly watch it. I, I watch some, some of it, and then I go to reviews, and I just read what happened in this episode because I, I don't have time to watch all the episodes, so I, I kind of select it. Asective about what I, which one I watch, um, but yeah, I follow the the series, so I'm interested in what what do you, what is your takeaway from from that and the past discussion we had on decision making and leverage, or yeah. then the linked one leverage. Well, I, I would say uh, the the plot. I, I would say 40% of the plot does have some interesting content um, as it relates to, you know, um, uh, 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 I wouldn't say a philosophical awareness, but like a, a deeper awareness about what the consequences are with, with power um, being put to the max. Um, you know, clearly there has been uh, I would say um, in in today's time um, power is considered to be something that is a a very sensitive topic power Mm -hmm. I think um, 40 years ago had a different feeling to it which is that you know if you wield power you're you are good like um, there's this type of might makes right type of thing and that kind of allowed um you know kind of like u.s superpower hegemony to kind of uh continue on a very high momentum Uh, i guess this is like a political thing um and and i guess the the show kind of makes fun of the idea that um power um, wield uh, uh, power power wielders um, can be (laughs) um, psychopathic they they are at least you know victims of their own um, follies right of their personality follies and and that could uh, tumble take a bad tumble for the rest of society consequences Mm -hmm. Yeah, j- just for context, for those who, <laughs> who join in, in yeah. the middle, uh, <clears throat> we were discussing about um, uh, the TV show The Boys and how does that, in the mind of Matt, relate to <laughs> to our previous discussion about the decision making. Um, yeah, I-, I think there's a there's some kind of um, like obvious, uh, perhaps a bit like already. Well explored uh, theme about um, what kind of like what is the system in place that incentivizes certain type of individuals with certain 
characteristics in such a power position because because in the in the in the show there's a there's clearly a, a, a themes uh, about um, uh, those who get the, the power uh, even with like I don't want to spoil but even for, for a temporary time what kind of um, psychological effect it has on them and um, yeah, and, and basically um, the, the question is, it, does the system incentivize certain traits, certain people with certain traits to be at the position of power? Or is it like uh, the opposite? Or is it purely reciprocal? Like in the sense that as soon as you achieve a certain uh, like level or status in the system, uh, then you, you have to adopt certain things certain you know traits so that you that matches with this type of uh, level I, I i don't say I, i'm for any of these positions but i'm i mean this this kind of topics have been uh discussed and and and, <clears throat> and um superheroes uh, uh stories are mainly about that like what what it means that to be a, a superhero like a a good a good person Right, that wants to like if you can use the power to change things, uh, you will do it if for something and to the detriment of something else, right? And and so it's it's always like with this double edged for uh, you know sword where you 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 can do harm when you want to do good, right? And it's basically always like that, and how they cope with that. The famous, uh, you know, um, phrase uh, with great power, great, uh, great responsibilities, is uh, like the the general trope behind it, right? Um, yeah. But I uh, wonder, is it? Do you think? I mean, you know, you you get to look at power as a privilege or as a right, in a sense, and then you get the oldest histories that trace. You know, our ideas about power are either maybe religious or political. Mm -hmm. And then there's always this dominance from the political side where you have this incentive to be superior and then act in a certain way. You know, at some point you would expect this to be like someone in power either has, you know, the physical capability or they have the ability to gather people to, to control them in a way, whether it's, you know, morally good or bad. It's, it's yeah a matter of detail but then there comes the religious power and then you get the thought of god crushing power you know these superheroes think of themselves as gods they're not humans they're not like petty fragile humans the gods so but then you get another mix between where it was the monarchy standpoint which is you have this king or uh yeah or a proxy and they're like yeah a basically proxy. they are yeah. the, the son of God. They are a representative. So they are godly. They are anointed through the power of God. And mm. it makes you wonder on how productive this relationship is and whether it's just a, you know, a preconception that we have more so than a reality. Is power a, re a reality or is it just a conceptual one? But, but it's, yeah, but it's still a, a definition or an understanding of power uh, from uh, an individual perspective, right? But you can have like an, an the opposite of, of this uh, spectrum, like the, the core beliefs of probably communism, where, where, where it's not about one individual, it's about, you know, uh, ideally everyone, right? Well, in practice, communism, I mean, I mean, the I mean, power of ideally. communism was the weakness of the individual. Not yes. So the yes, but the, the collective it, was the weakness of the individual. But, but it, it, you know, it comes with this idea that uh, the, the power system works for, 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 for the many, not for, for one, right? That's debatable, but yes, I, I see your point. But I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's in, uh, applied like this, right? I'm not saying that. Uh, actually, I don't think that we have an actual example of communism applied. We have things that relate to it, but I'm not sure that from from the 
the core beliefs of what it is. Uh, any of the of the system that we saw that labeled themselves with with this title are close to what the ideas uh, appeal to. Actually, like in retrospect, right? Not uh, at the time. I'm sure they were believing hardcore that they, they were in, but in retrospect, they you can judge them through the basis of their ideas and indeed for shots. Well, I think the reason communism can never be truly applied is because you have to sacrifice or at least be willing to sacrifice yourself as an individual to the collective. Mm -hmm. so if that means the prosperity of your group, you can choose to let yourself be eaten by them if that's you know the only way to stop them from dying for a while. So it makes you really weigh in all these ideas of where the power really lies. And it's a very practical question, more so than a philosophical one, because yes. it's very context-driven. And yeah, you may think the power is there, but then it kind of shifts, like politicians and the crowds who vote for them. Yeah. Where is the power? Yeah, and in the sense we can say that uh, any individual with some kind of power has this power because because the collective, in a sense, allowed it to to be. In, you know, so. So I, with with communism, I understand it that uh, it's it, it was Karl Marx was trying to solve the problem of alienation uh, within capitalism, which is that um, people sacrifice half their lifetime, um, missing birthdays, um, uh, putting a lot of you know slave hours. Um, to, 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 to meet deadlines, to work in factories, to, to be part of the industrial system. And at the end of the day, they do not own the property or own the, um, the, the, the material benefits of what they produce. And, um, and in order to fix this alienation, um, he used, you know, kind of like the, the Hegelian principle of dialectic turned it into a material dialectic and then you know kind of proceeded on as saying let's change history for good by um by by analyzing capitalism uh as it is turn it into a class warfare um you know narrative and see what happens what what emerges after um, this this combat between class warfare and capitalism, and it should be communism, right? But so the the, the idea behind that communism hasn't been put in practice. I would say it hasn't been perfected uh, in a sense that um, you know we've 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 gone through the dialectic process and we have moved on, right? Uh, in a sense, we are still one foot in capitalism and one foot looking at, you know, where where there's a safe, um, uh, you know, next step, uh, in a sense. And yeah. I'm not sure if that, yeah, but anyways, go ahead. Uh, I, um, yeah, I just want to say, to say that, to, to add to your point, that this is also a rejection of this idea of capital. And that yes. this, 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 uh, this idea of um, that you like the, the first who have some kind of capital we always win in the system because it, it is meant to to increase capital for those who already have them have those right so right. this idea this, right. this idea of, of class comes from from that as well like there's always some kind, in the system that there's always some kind of a, a group of people that from which others will exploit the, the labor in order to create this capital. And this always be the case that even if people switch from from one to, to another, uh, it's, 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 well, is it working now, uh, Yefan? Yes, now it is, but I think I'm, I'm having to reload the page a few times before I, I okay. hear it. I, I'm sorry. Maybe sometimes the, I, I know that uh, Kumo Space is uh, not working well on some uh, brother, so um, I don't know. Uh, which one you are using? That's for you to know. Common space no, is not. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, 
yeah, so this, this, and the idea of communism and this idea of collective uh, that provides for, for, for everyone is, is exactly this idea of rejection of capital. And that uh, people should not work for, 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 for the illusion that at some point they will have some, but they should work for a system that provides for them the necessary things for, for life, right? But but I agree. I mean I mean we are switching like into deep <laughs> political thing, and I don't know if it's it was the point. But right? we're just saying I was just saying that uh, that uh, it's interesting how how a system that that um, that incentivizes individuals to be uh, to like that at least that that likes the idea of individuals in power uh, creates uh, more ideas around superheroes than you can find in other places where the collective is more important. Like this idea of superhero is the is like the ultimate point of uh, the notion of uh, individualism in some in some sense. Right? Because because from a community standpoint it makes no sense. Like there's there's no uh, evolutionary utility to uh, a great individual with more power than all the others it makes no sense because mm-hmm. everyone should have its place in the in the group which has some utility but not beyond the group always uh, contained within the the expectation of the group right so in in that sense i find it really interesting and the the only exceptions to that is uh war time where where then you need big figures to like even in China and in and, and communist countries, uh, you you need some kind of hero to to show the good, what is expected from from the from the mass, right? Um, <clears throat> but they are more like used as ideas than real people with real power. It's 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 like the, the antithesis of uh, superheroes as they are portrayed in comic books. Uh, from the years, I, I do feel like it's not the same kind of uh, heroes, right? Uh, in that sense. Well, uh, one thing yeah. I I find that the character analysis and these superhero movies do quite well, especially these modern ones, you know, Marvel included and all that, is that despite having all the human power, they there is a, there is a weakness in the sense that they are always put in a situation where they are in a maximum leverage situation mm-hmm. where their power um, fizzles out uh, <laughs> in a way where it's in equilibrium with their situation. So what I mean by this is, um, you know, the most powerful person in that, um, in that series, right, um, is kind of also a victim of his own ego, right, and and his his need for being loved, or or you know this this kind of uh, ego maniacal um, you know fet- self fetishism, right, and that leaves him quite impotent, quite powerless uh, at the same time, and this this character analysis is actually quite important because this is this is quite true of how political leadership. Uh, operates behind the scenes, you know, in, in the sense that you you could have uh, somebody who, like like you know, President Xi Jinping, um, uh, Putin, Obama, you know, like pe- people who have immense power, backing different types of power. Like Obama had like you know the people's will at at one point, uh, majority in, in in Congress and whatnot. But rendered quite powerless at the end of the day, um, given that there are constraints within those powers, right? And so, um, it th- the so basically the the key point or, that I realized from this analysis is that when we talk about power, we shouldn't talk about power as an absolute quantity, but power as a relative measure, right? And also as a momentum measure the change in power over time um, matters more than um, mm. the actual absolute power, the actual quantity of power that you have. For instance, um, not to spoil in, you know, in the series or anything, but when there is a clear change in power from somebody who has no power to 
all of a sudden, you know, comparable power, even if it's not the most. That is an exciting transition period. And, um, yeah. and you know, that's also, you know, again, that, that also goes the same with political um, mm -hmm. leadership as well. Yeah. Yeah, to that note, there's um, uh, an interesting uh, um, topic that I see quite often now, and I think it's it's not necessarily recent, but now it's being trendy in some in some in some way. <clears throat> is this idea of um, uh, creating scenarios? Well, like um, uh, as designers, I mean, uh, creating um, situations that are um, like fictional in a sense, but based on reality, where you shift intentionally um, the power, like to the opposite, um, and 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 see how people react to that, and see what comes out of it, which is what kind of outcomes are good and what kind of outcomes are bad, and how do you then from that from that understanding, how do you use that kind of um, understanding to, uh, you know, uh, just pick the things that, that worked and uh, push it into your current state so that you rebalance the, the current system to move it towards the direction you want, you want it to move. Uh, and um, like it's this idea of uh, system merging um, and I mean, I find it interesting, although they, it, it seems like um, if it happens in the safe contained environment, it works well. It does not work when you play it as as if it was really reality, because because then uh, then it won't feel like as really as real, and that everyone would play the, by the rule. Because if it's a real game that you say, okay, for one day we play this game, we said this is the rule. Uh, and uh, the rules of the game, and this is how we will play it, and you let unfold it. Uh, it's a learning experience here, right? And it works pre pretty well. But I, see, I, I, I saw some example of people trying to do that as a, as a, as a continuous uh, thing within, you know, project or initiatives. And um, I, I see some potential harms here because we... That in one side you put some some expectations on, on communities and and group of, of people that can be labeled as minorities in the current system that suddenly we say okay you have some power that they they, they didn't have have in the past uh, you let them play with that just to see what happens but but nothing is grounded into you know the actual system so increase false expectations and I, I don't see how like how how to properly handle that, but um, yeah. I find this interesting. Um, if we if we try to relate this, uh, what you were saying to to uh, a designer, a design process. Well, um, when when designers uh, <laughs> create these novel scenarios, like for instance, um, I, I, you know, this wasn't a this wasn't a designer uh, influence type of thing, but it was um, when I was doing my master's program, we had this little exercise where we have um, people act as if, you know, some were janitors, some were, you know, like CEOs and whatever. And then when you flip the roles, people act differently. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you do these like role playing exercises, you, you all of a sudden realize you know, that that power really is just something that is, you know, a, 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 a social construct that um, isn't really real. But um, obviously, you know, in reality, you obey these constructs very, very um, faithfully because uh, reality has a certain type of no take backs, right? There's financial leverage, there's operational leverage. Any decision that, that is made in reality, there's a consequence to it where sometimes you can't go backwards in time. And, um, and so in a sense, this, the power that is granted, 
that wasn't there to begin with, but one that is kind of um, uh, there a priori, as in like, you know, you're just kind of pl plopped there in a position and the power ladder has been pre-arranged for you. Those those types of power arrangements, um, I I think, are are somewhat granted based upon um, what the types of variables that leadership or needed at a particular point in point in time. So, for instance, like you know sometimes you know the, the particular type of leadership that you need for type of um to, in order to grow really fast right you need this type of like visionary energy mm -hmm. and um and, but that that type of leadership doesn't work very well when you get into like maturity uh and whatnot where it's 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 less about vision but more about processes and um the, I, I guess the, the I guess the problem is that there isn't there isn't a you know power and leadership. This is one of those things where um, there isn't a particular type of person or personality that works for you know power and leadership for all cases. So it's very situational, and if it is situational, then um, an organization would would be served best by having this type of awareness that um, power should be placed with a little bit more flexibility rather than rigidity, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah, I propose just that we hold on the on the, the conversation, I just want to make sure that uh, because we, we have like a, some people that joined and uh, I don't know if we like the, the, the goal of this station is not really to necessarily continue the, the last discussion on philosophy, although it's really interesting. So I'm just uh, opening the floor for, for everyone who wants to say something um, uh, and uh, have anything in mind uh, that is not necessarily related to the conversation. And, and then I propose that uh, after that, we uh, just uh, briefly discuss and maybe the, the topic we are, we are just discussing now could be the topic for the next um, philosophy and design uh, discussion. I don't know if you want it so. Um, so then we can discuss that. But I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything like what you have in mind. How do you feel? <laughs> like the, the the goal of this uh, virtual chalet is uh, really to to have an informal conversation. Yeah, has has anyone yeah. um, played with uh, the? the metal brought fractals on Blender yet. <laughs> Sorry, I think your friend was uh, trying to say something before you, you, you jumped in, but... Oh, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, are you referring to the Blender 3D platform? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the 3D I, mean, I don't really use that. I'm only aware of it. I don't really use the platform. I mean, I don't, although I like it, but I don't really... I mostly do the UI part of stuff, so... <laughs> Oh yeah. So what what I was like saying, I think uh, to continue to continue part of the point you were making earlier about I think power, uh, maybe we could try to have a sort of a discussion on that. Is uh, you mentioned that there are, there are roles that already exist that people kind of step into, and and that's how power then kind of shifts based on pre-existing roles. So I, I think I'm just curious about like, or at least I try to think about like what exactly does it mean to have a power in, in a system? Like, is, is it something that is a momentum that is uh, caught on as a result of uh, maybe uh, the status quo or maybe what, where the things are going? Like, for example, if we're really talking about clean energy these days, which is like the need of the hour kind of the thing. So and anyone who makes uh, an anyone who makes a step in that direction is 
probably going to be benefiting by having a lot of support. But the power doesn't necessarily come just by the momentum of where the movement is going. But I think it comes from uh, the ability to actually uh, relate the need of the hour to also a real uh, practical plan, right? I think I think uh, even if we go back to other examples of like dictators, I think those people who were in, in the war, I think all of them had a kind of very practical plan to actually continue power. So I, th I think I'm just curious about like how what you think about uh, the structure of power, or maybe you could relate back this relate this back to design as well, because I think uh, in design we kind of giving shape. Uh, design in, in general is like a form giving exercise. So there is inherent power in giving form to something. So I'm just curious, like if any of you have thoughts about, uh, like, just to continue a bit of that previous conversation. Uh, but is power just inherently just a role-based act, or is it is it something that a lot of brains are coming together to form a plan that works works out? Does that make sense at all? I I, I think um, it's quite useful to 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 hold <clears throat> simultaneously multiple perspectives about how power um, kind of operates. For instance, um, before. President Xi Jinping took power in China, right? Um, the, the previous Chinese presidents were all just uh, uh, engineers, like very technical uh, plan type of people. So it's kind of like to your point, um, uh, power is given to somebody with a plan on like how to build more cities at a faster pace, right? And, 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 and whatnot to, to achieve a technical uh efficiency that couldn't be otherwise achieved without that leadership without having the crown so to speak right without having you know the ability to you know command resources right but on the other hand once you achieve these types of technical miracles and feats then you pave a way for somebody like Xi Jinping to come in and and take over the at you know at the helm who doesn't have any technical efficiencies you know they don't he doesn't have a plan but he has a completely different type of plan an ideal plan right like it's one where let's take not you know let's not go for technical prowess but let's try to cr increase our relative political power you know in in the pacific by taking Taiwan and stuff like that, right? Um, I, I mean, it's not to focus on China or you know, politics, but it's just to really kind of um, give you like a concrete illustration of, uh, to your point, power has this, you know, again, it, there's this flexibility in the roles where, like you said, it works very well if you, all you do is just let technical people take helm. But when technical people, you know, um, after several generations do this over and over again, it creates this type of negative energy where then it kind of invites uh, an unwanted, you know, uh, a hacker to take over uh, the helm, so to speak, at the end. Yeah. I mean, uh, one of the things that I think we're floating a little bit outside of the kind of design realm, which we've done a lot recently, um, and to be a little <laughs> more pragmatic about it. Maybe you have to define like design and then define power, right? So if design is this idea that you want to implement some kind of more desired future, right? And then the act of designing is the, is the materialization of that future. And then you go back and you look at like power like Bertrand Russell would define it, right? Which is the like the ability to produce intended effects, right? So that would be kind of like one definition of power, your, your ability to, to actually make something happen. And so in the course of a design project, you can look at power distribution in terms of those people who actually have the ability to produce those intended effects. And so navigating power is related to creating that future that you want. Right, so then we have kind of a more narrow definition of what it is that we're talking about in terms of design and power and how it affects the 
you know, the materialization of that future, right? And one of the things that we're seeing is, and, you know, for better or for worse, you have this kind of old institutional power, right? Which is, and I think what's interesting about power also, and I think the, the Marvel stuff is interesting because how it is that power is conferred onto the individual is a really interesting thing. Right, like, does it come from a radioactive spider bite, or from being an alien? Like, is it like ex machina, essentially, or is it, or is it from within, right? Which is temporary and conferred by the people. Right? You talked about the difference between, like, Xi Jinping and Obama, for example. Right? Those are two very different systems in terms of the way that power is um, conferred onto those individuals. So I think that's a that's a really interesting study, and that's a way to go back and look at. If I'm trying to get something done, who has the power to actually get it done, right? Um, and I think that's something that designers have to learn how to navigate the small P and large P politics of getting things done because it might be an internal problem or it might be a regulatory problem, right? And so you look at it in a whole bunch of different scales. And so the notion of understanding power so that you can achieve that future, I think is super useful. You know, there's also another practic pragmatic way of looking at power. Uh, and and it's it's basically from the perspective that of, of, of ownership, right? So if you think about it in terms of like a pre, you know, um, equity or a pre-public company um, type of Starbucks, right? Where if you were an owner of Starbucks, you can go in and and you don't have to pay for coffee. The barista just makes you coffee because you're an owner, right? However, you know, if you're a shareholder of Starbucks, right, you give up that right to get free coffee from Starbucks and you allow Starbucks as a business to kind of confer this privilege of getting free coffee to, to Starbucks members, so to speak, right? Like the rewards club or something. Basically just another way of um, you know, alienating the the rights of an owner onto customers, and so then you have like this kind of division of, uh, or division of this type of what was what is traditionally known as like ownership privileges, right? So a shareholder gets gives up ownership privileges in order to get more value for uh, the stock ownership. So, except, that so that's, except that that's inherent in the purchase of those shares, right? Like, no, no, no. I, I understand what the, by buying my shares, which is a positive action, I make a decision knowing what that ownership, what rights that ownership confers onto me, right? So I understand that <laughs> my rights as a class B shareholder are different than, you know, a class A founder. Or something, something like that, right? So, I think in that in that particular case, at least hopefully in a working system, it's clear what it is that I purchase, right? In terms in terms of in terms of the rights that are conferred to me in in purchasing. Them, right? Yeah, make, make no mistake. I, I wasn't I'm also confused about. I'm also expressing some level of trust that those benefits that are then given to members will increase the value of my shares, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm basically saying, I trust this man, by my, my purchasing those shares is a signaling in a capitalist system anyway, in the confidence that the management will grow the value of the company. And that's how I make that decision, right? Or, <laughs> or I say, it's, it's crypto and, I'm, and I understand <laughs> the hype cycle, right? Like in, anywhere, somewhere along the line, I'm, I'm looking to maximize my, my investment to get something back. So, but yeah, anyway, that's, I, I just think, I think in those terms, power is a little bit different because I'm purchasing it with the full, hopefully the full knowledge of what it is that I'm doing. Now, that said, that's the Robin Hood problem, where people are getting into these contracts without actually understanding what it is that A, what the risks are of that ownership and B, what the actual upside is. And so there, that's a, you know, there, there you kind of get into the notion of asymmetrical power based on asymmetrical knowledge distribution, right? Like we know less than a hedge fund, right? 
And so that's where the kind of power is knowledge, or knowledge is power. I guess either way. But yeah, it's, that's one of those things that happens. Right? I mean, it's complex in, in that sense. Yeah, but making a market, right? That's essentially what Robin Hood is trying to do is basically access an untapped market, which is the the un the unbrokeraged, right? Um, younger investors, right? And um, and but who's but to whose benefit? To whose benefit? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously those with like. Uh, a higher order of understanding the processes and the rule makers and the rule, you know, um, builders, right? The, you know, the, the, the incumbent powers, obviously, at least in the first iteration, uh, in, in most of these systems. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Jeremy, to yeah. I just want to, I just want to say, because I feel like we, we agree on, on many things, but I, I think there's, um, something to say that, that that we can all agree on that the, the power the, the term power seems like it's it's something right when we speak about it it, it seems like it's something uh, and I, I would be skeptical of that and I would say it's, it's about the interaction itself like the nature of the interaction uh, it is some power at some point and and therefore some privilege but it's it's always um, it's always about the nature of the interaction that defines what it is that is it a power and that and therefore it's a power as a, as a term is uh, we have to understand it as an heterogeneous uh, thing that is not always the, the, the same that has not the same properties or characteristics or that that be that uh, that um, uh, go by the, the, the same rules right so it's, it's really about the, the interaction that defines what what it is that it is a, some form of of power uh, compared to something else, uh, because in the case of uh, politics, uh, in a political system with a big P, um, <clears throat> uh, there's some tacit rules and some explicit rules about what it is uh, that politicians can do that implies power in itself. Uh, and this relationship between, between what is allowed to be done and what the system expects as uh, things to be done is the relation to to power itself, uh, and and this is where we can we can say like it's 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 kind of obvious power, right? Uh, the fact that some people have some type of role in a society uh, is a form of power, but it's not it's not the same power as we are discussing here uh, with shareholders and companies, right? This is not the same type of, of power, and and this is where I want to say that. Um, I, I agree with what has been said uh, so far. I just want to make this distinction that's, that say, okay, uh, we have, like, we could, we could even invent new form of power uh, just given the type of relationship that we have in the, a, a specific situation, right? Um, the fact that, um, um, I don't know, the fact that I, I like and I prefer to do certain things at home and my wife uh, doesn't like it, and she don't want to do it, makes me, uh, allows me to have some power about those things that uh, she doesn't have. Uh, is, it, is it necessarily a good or bad thing? It's another question, right? But uh, is a, a form of power in itself, uh, and, and therefore a form of privilege. Uh, it's not necessarily a zero-sum game in the sense that it doesn't mean that it's uh, that she loses something in the in 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 this understanding of power, right here. She can have power about other things that I don't have power for, and it's totally fine. And it's just um, a description here, uh, not um, not uh, an activism or, or some kind of political understanding of what it is to have power uh, over things, right? Uh, which I feel like are less. Um, than the sensitive to discuss in the sense, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, but that, that's kind of why I like the Bertrand Russell definition because it's contextual, yeah. right? Because it depends very much on what the effects are that you want to enact, right? And that, and that it's yes. it's specific to a situation. You may have power in one context but not in another. Like you may be the boss at work and not at home, you know, for example, right? Like. Um, and that means that, that, that I, I think of something like who gets to control the radio on a road trip, 
you know, like a really <laughs> simple kind of example, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, because yeah. the intended effect there is listening to the music that you want to listen to, um, yeah. right? And then, and then, yeah, it's like you also have the negotiation and the and the lowercase p political calculation of whether it's worth listening to what you want to listen to and um, and ruining the rest of the weekend. <laughs> because you know like <clears throat> so there's a there's an inter there's a um there's almost like a kind of a like lose the battle to win the war kind of <laughs> approach to it in that sense there but but i do I, like I, that's why i really i like the bertrand russell thing because i like any one of these kind of things that that allow you to think contextually yes i think are, I think are beneficial they give you the kind of flexibility because they also become analytical tools right because then you can go in and say in this given context given the players given the actors that are available who actually has the ability to you know their, their desire yeah right? I, I i like it as well but i have some like i see the limitation as well because it's narrow framing of someone who has the ability to uh you know, um, move things in the direction of uh, the stated future uh, is uh, like I agree. It's some form of power, and here within that the context of design makes sense. Uh, but but then you need this um, kind of multi understanding of what can can be forms of power in the, in in the same space that that might. Um, uh, reduce your ability to access to the resources needed, but provide you with more power about other things. And having only this this, this definition seems to be um, like um, uh, not so useful then, because you miss other forms of uh, uh, useful definition of of, uh, uh, of uh, power. And, and this is where I, I like more. But this is really a, perf a, a personal preference mm -hmm. uh, to define it as as um, just uh, the nature of the relationship, and then let's let's define it with given the context, than having a, a definition that posits that power is 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 given the fact that you can access and put in place the resources to to go somewhere, right? Which is really directed way of describing uh, power, yeah, which. which I mean, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not like, I, I don't want to defend it too much, but I just, what I, I think that it's not um, monolithic, right? That, that it's a, it's a really heterogeneous kind of idea of there are multiple, like if you, for example, are withholding resources, you know, you have some ability to affect whether or not somebody else can enact that future. Right, can can deploy that right, and so yes. or if you have the ability to vote vote them out, or you have the ability to not buy the stuff. So it's a it's a really multifaceted. There's not like one single person who holds the power. It's everybody mm -hmm. holds kind of like percentages of power, and it becomes that's much more a game of. I mean, I don't know if probabilities is the right term, but kind yes. of like fractional power, right? In a, in a given and, and and I think it does allow for a complex reading of the space on many levels, because it's not just a unilateral, you know, I have the, you know, th there are some circumstances, um, Xi Jinping as an example, <laughs> like where you can, you know, or, you know, any, anybody who has the, the ability to bulldoze their way through something, you know, kind of does have that. But I think in most cases, it's much more nuanced and, and it's more of an analytical tool to look at the complexity of it than it is to kind of like pick a winner, right? But but here again, I I totally agree with you. I, I think I agree with you uh, on all, all what you said. But here again, see um, the 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 form of uh, of the impression of limitless power that um, Ch Chinese president has uh, is totally relative to the situation. Again, and this is where again I, I totally like this idea of uh, relationship is uh, and form of interaction. It's the, the, the poor the, the, the poor he has on society on so, on Chinese society is because of the is is partially because of um, the economic situation of China and this economic situation is given the fact that many uh, developed countries use China as 
the place to build about anything, right? Yeah. And if tomorrow uh, the president were to decide that um, because we want to reduce, uh, you know, CO2 emission uh, drastically to the level, I don't know, any level, uh, we have to cut the production of any industry in the country by half. Won't be a move that he would be able to do, given the situation. He's constrained to to the situation because other players are playing the same game than than he's. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah, and, and and his power seems like again really huge on other things. But on this one, he would be really powerless in a form to decide something as drastic as, as such, right? Um, and in the same form, um, European countries that you know are really happy to say, well, well, CO two level are one of the lowest on Earth. Yes, but you exploit a Chinese country to <laughs> develop many things that make that you know for the huge part of the the pollution part of, of this world. Um, uh, if we were to cut this, uh, we might uh, regain some form of power on things, but we will lose on uh, other things, uh, especially um, uh, production as aspects that are part of the economic system today, right? So, uh, so I'm going to say something that might be a little bit controversial. This isn't something that I agree with, but this might be something that um, might add on to the discussion so we can probably go forward. Um, I think, and back to the Robin Hood example, when there is ambiguity in terms of trying to understand exactly what power means or in terms of like what risks are and, 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 and things like that. Any, any time when rules are unclear, those who understand the rules um, can, can engage in a form of deception onto other parties. So one example would be um, Amazon customer support, right? So basically, like, you want to return something, and they're really, really friendly. They let you, like, return it, you know, you send it back, shipping, they pay for it, right? Shipping and all that stuff. And you feel like you have a lot of power because they gave you exactly what you wanted, right? All you had to do was go on their, you know, very customer-friendly UI, talk to their people on, on their platform, their technology platform. And and then you get what, exactly what you wanted. So this is this is them overtly telling you, you have the power. You know, you just tell us why you want to you want to return it, and you get it right. And the cost is on Amazon, even though clearly, like you know, you could be cheating Amazon and whatnot. But at the same time, this is deception because you have to use their platform to communicate with them they control the interaction the the data they're the ones who are asking the questions right you don't get to dictate the terms and they offer you a solution in which you accept so so in, in, on the one hand yes you get this type of power in the overt sense that they you know kind of concede that to you but on, on another sense, you are being deceived because, you know, you operate within their within their domain. They actually hold uh, kind of the the pattern recognition, the, you know, maybe they could do something in the long term, right, to to take advantage and, and gain leverage over you. And, and, and this is, you know, this, I believe, is. At, at the core of how power power struggles have kind of co-evolved uh, once power and privilege can kind of be separated at birth, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think part of being the platform owner, like the benefit of that where you skim points on everything, right, is the especially if you're close to a monopoly, 
is the ability to set switching costs, even if they're beneficial, right? So customer service, the amazing customer service and the ability to return things is essentially a moat, right? It's something that you can offer because you have a vertically integrated system that includes, you know, the, the product, whether you've stolen that IP from somebody else in your store or not, leave that aside. Um, but yeah, you've got, so you've got the product, you have the, the discovery mechanism, you have the purchasing mechanism, you have the delivery mechanism. Like you own, you're vertically integrated and you own all of it. And that vertical integration is essentially your moat because of the, and this is just a benefit that you can provide to maintain your moat, essentially. Um, and so the, once you achieve asymmetrical power in terms of market domination, the things that you do to promote are essentially played on your terms, right? Um, which is, which I mean, it's an interesting study of what you could do when you when you own the whole when you own the whole stack, right? Yeah, I think it's, it's the same issue with uh, YouTube and this idea of creator platform creator, right? where everyone can be a creator of content um, and that you, you feel like you are empowered um, to be that creator because, because the platform tells you that you can make revenue of, uh, about what you create and that, you will, that they will help you reach an audience. And in that sense, again, they, they provide you with the power. But this is a, um, this is, um, a time and context sensitive power that, that is defined by the term of, of YouTube. And that is obscure in that sense that as soon as you run in a, a situation where someone, um, like let's say you are like many creators are in the situation that they, like let's say you do a review about a movie and that the, 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 park, the company that holds the rights about this movie is, um, striking your channel because because you created a, a, a you know a de defavorable um, a, a review about their their movie um, and that youtube says but basically that's not our shit this is yours um, <laughs> here you feel powerless because because all the power that 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 you have were given by youtube here they remove themselves from the game and therefore uh, remove the form of power that that was given to you in that sense, and in terms of design, it's it's again it's uh, um, it's it's where where if you see it as a as a, a scaffold uh, to your autonomy, um, which could be uh, like an energy to power, right, uh, or some form of power at least. Um, where all the scaffold relies on on one company, one entity, which can be one company or one individual, then the lack, the, the like the, the the absence of that entity or the absence of that uh, individual that remove the scaffold that comes with it, right? You you're just nothing is here to hold you, and um, in that sense, it's interesting because because it's um. Because your power is just an extension of the platform, of the company, or the individual, uh, in the same form as uh, what is um, a democracy, um, basically that, that the power of, of politicians is um, is provided by the scaffolds of given the rules of the society that we live in, right? That the, the the only difference is that um, the the relationship between that the scaffold that that um, that supports that that power uh, is not as direct as it is for uh, a company that holds the platform and that can basically decide in a clap and of the of the end that uh, uh, that they don't they do not longer support x or y right <laughs> and that's, that's, that's that's the game right that they have yes. they provide you with a with a certain amount of power that has a cap on it. Um, and you don't actually realize the cap until you hit the limits of your power, and they provide you that in exchange for their greater power, right? Yeah. That's 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 yeah. the that's the exchange. And it's when you hit the limits of your power that you start to understand the structure. Right? 
but but the lie the lie he is in the fact that they sell the idea that then you become more autonomous about how yeah. you make revenue, and the, the lie is really here is that uh, yes, but it's it's always um, you will always depend on them to decide how does that happen, right? And, uh, and there's you know this trend today in this idea that uh, everyone be, will become their own company at some point because this is the the most logical thing in a in a world where um, where basically we ask any individual to market themselves and to be the most competitive, um, which I, I guess is um, is the death of uh, autonomy is that you become a uh, servant of the of the of the market system right mm-hmm. because because you have to apply to uh, like to to comply to the rules of the market to 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 have some form of autonomy and therefore some form of power right uh, who decide the rule of the market then uh, and 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 you know here it's in the case of youtube and content creator it's it's clearly youtube right um, but it's not always as uh, obvious as uh, as this. Um, yeah, I find it really interesting as a conversation. I think that's the that's the kind of platform economy, like where you kind of you can as one way you can look at everything like a platform. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's a way of analyzing yes. the system, right? So who, yeah. who allows for the interaction? Who's selling the picks and shovels that allows you to go and mine for gold, right? And who's providing the transportation and all that? Yeah, it's, no, it is. It's really, really. Uh, it's really interesting. Yeah, but well, you, you said the key word, which, uh, Mark, you said, like, that's the game, right? <laughs> and that's that's the reason why there's that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's an old trope, but that's why we call it power games, right? Because at, at some point, um, it, it, you, lose, you lose control of reality because playing the game itself becomes the leverage it, it actually it, the rules of the game actually become the leverage of reality itself and that kind of um, you know that, that kind of transformation or shift uh, from from uh, reality into a game um, or at least you know from a from a past state to now you know a future state um, it's, it's the first time I've really thought about it essentially is kind of as an abstraction yeah yeah and, and, and in a way um you know just to give you like another one right um just another tech one right um you know a lot of these big tech firms like google and apple they they like the idea that quality of images right are are increasing because the data size per image um, goes up, and then you can charge. You know, basically, the Apple model you can charge based upon the the, the gigabytes of storage, right? The the cloud uh, storage, and so this is so now we have data inflation. All of which this is complicit because you're as a customer you're getting everything that you wanted, which is better quality stuff, right? But you, you can't go back. You can't go back anymore. <laughs> We're yeah. going to start exchanging like eight bit songs from like old video games. <laughs> yeah, I just want to, to say something and then I, I just I want to ask some something to you guys and and then we will end the conversation because I have to go back home. <laughs> so I will leave you. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I, I think one, because people see it as, um, as some kind of. Um, unsolvable thing, right? Then you have the platform economy, you have some players that will basically set up the rules and, and that's it. Uh, my reply to that is um, diversity is always the best answer to that issue that if you introduce more diversity, then you will have more people setting different rules, more things that are different. And therefore it will introduce more chaos at some point, that's for sure. Um, but to the benefit of people, because now they will have real choice, right? They will have more options available to them. And the issue today is that you don't see that at home. Like you, you have basically markets become more and more concentrated and less and less um, diversified. 
right? So you have like no really more option than uh, be on YouTube and uh, have a Patreon page and hope to make a revenue at some point, right? If we just speak of creators, as I mentioned before. Um, so now, uh, based on all we discussed, I want to ask you guys, what do you want as a topic for next uh, design and philosophy discussion? It could be like a, a basically a continuation of, of this one because I feel like it's a good, it's a real interesting topic that we just in a sense stretch the surface, right? Um, um, or it can be something like adjacent to that. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I mean, like I've been, one of the things that I thought about after the last call was the, the genesis of this whole project, which is the notion of like critical thinking, the critical thinking for designers. Yes. Yes. And so there is a thread of pragmatic philosophical thinking that, you know, like the, it is the kind of like the Dewey um, the John Dewey kind of like very pragmatic kind of philosophical approach to things. And I'm wondering if there's anything in that direction that can like, tie, this, tie this stuff together again. Right? Like, and it, it's, again, it's an early thing. I was going to write something down about it. Um, but that was that was the, the road that I was that I was going on because there's a kind of like there's a kind of a, a rational like rationality is a big undercurrent in what became the kind of pragmatism behind critical thinking, right? And so there is an actual like thread of thinking that takes us that, and maybe that's a way to bring the two things back together, or kind of or pull it down so that we're we're looking at the notion of like this kind of pragmatic. Mm. Well, I would no. say if you look at the sorry, no go on. Well, I, I would say if you look at a lot of the technology companies, they run a barbell system, which is that on the one hand they have um, you know these these technologists, these these coders, these programmers, these developers, right? Um, those with these talents to uh, make systems, make these machines do exactly what they are meant to do and uh, on the on the other part of the barbell you have these creative business leaders who come up with the rules of the game and figure out the strategy right uh, they're abstract thinkers you know much like designers right but designers in a with capital right capital <laughs> and leverage and people and emotions and and essentially um, you could take that as a template, these tech companies, and and kind of construct these, uh, reconstruct or re, re, redo um, these two different types of cultures and see if you can figure out a way to, to make it work together, right? I've been reading something really interesting uh, lately on the generalist, David Epstein's book. It's quite interesting. And it had a really uh, quite... I don't know, powerful example on the on, on the analogies and how important they are to get us to think outside our field to actually solve problems in our field. And I thought that this may go quite well hand in hand with what Mark was saying about being pragmatic uh, and you know what it means to to do practical reasoning and also to have like this type to analogies, philosophy and analogy. Which Sorry, is, which which book was that that you're talking about? Uh, it's got a long title, and I have a short memory. So it's Arrange Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. Oh, okay, it's okay. Yeah, I've got that. I've got that here. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's actually a pretty decent book. If you're, I mean, I'm not a fan of the stories, but I really like the the, the idea of how mm -hmm. analogies are being explained. And I mm -hmm. thought that this might be really interesting for us as designers because I we work with scenarios, we work a lot with analogies depending i mean on where we stand but to, to when we talk to clients we really need analogies to break down certain problems uh, depending on their complexity and how far removed we are from the, the given vocabulary so i think that might be interesting uh, so mm -hmm. something around practical 
thinking and analogies as an example. But of course, there cannot be other ways to, to help us connect. Yeah. To the book. I feel like there's an interesting tension between that, which is between pra pra pragmatism and some form of uh, poetry that are mm. metaphor. Right, there's a, 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 an, an inter interesting tension there, because 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 I, I do feel like the one, like some kind of um, like um, feed the other and vice versa, right? And that, that it's useful that you need some form of uh, sense of abstraction to be able to relate to uh, some form of of pragmatism, right? To transpose your pragmatism on, on, on some place to a, another place, which which is helpful in the analogy sense, right? Um, and, and, um, and, and you need some form of, well, I do feel like personally, uh, we need some form of, not necessarily poetry as the practice of writing down, you know, po po uh, poetry, but, but uh, of connecting things that are uh, art, that are not necessarily, like, that we don't see necessarily causal relationships right um and yeah so there's a form of tension that could be explored yes that's, that's it's really interesting because i read uh range and another book called shortcut um and range is the kind of the more pragmatic kind of shortcut is actually all about the use of metaphor in everything from like political speech and writing and it's not it's not it's, it's quite a small book but it's really kind of interesting he goes into kind of like the the um you know, like the three strikes policy of the, the U.S. government and, and how using that um, that metaphor helped to situate the actual idea and how they it. it's actually a good little, it's, it's, it's short, it's like, you know, afternoon kind of read. Just it's David quite, McCauley? See, I was trying to look it up just now. Is it, is it an orange, orange cover? Mm, not quite. It's got like an illustration. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and find it. I can't. I've been uh, doing the Amazon thing here, but it doesn't seem to like it. There are quite a few books with that name. So, would you be fine with with that as a as a theme? Um, as, uh, John Pollock. Sorry, there it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really like it actually. I'm, I'll post something. I gave a. I gave a lecture years ago to the um, first years at the design school here after I taught, um, and it was about that thing. It was about the combination of the pendulum between rationality and creativity for designers. Right. Um, let's see if I can. I kind of sort of like, I tried to abstract it for like writing purposes. Um, I'll see if I can polish that up and, and, and send it out. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think those two books actually are quite good in terms of comparing the two. Cool. Um, then yeah, then let's try to go in that direction. I, I that I, so I would just write down like a brief. Like to in brief the, the theme and we'll see what's uh, basically what happens during the conversation, right? That's that's the goal of the, um, I mean I I think it's actually a really fascinating thing in terms of education and also the concept of expertise in design. Because that more creative side to it is a, a really interesting thing to try and pin down. And to, I mean, it's actually like impossible to pin down in a way. And yet you're still supposed to ascribe some kind of talent to be able to think that way in a way that you can't quantify, but makes the difference between those who, you know, are, who have talent and those who don't, and they're being too blunt about it. But like it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's a, I find that that side of it to be fascinating. Yeah. And, and I don't know if there's a. It's interesting to find the philosophical underpinnings of of that, right? Because it doesn't lie in like aesthetics. Does it, where does it where does it lie? Does it lie in you know the invention part of rhetoric? You know, well, at the foundation of both you know 
outside of metaphors and analogies, we will find the conceptualization of the world. So I think that's, you know, kind of the, the foundation of all this happening on the philosophy and how we feel about. So yeah, I think this would be a really interesting thing to further discuss. I'd be happy to join. As always. Is that, is that next week? Huh. Is it? Do you want it to be next week? It's up to you guys. I'm, just, I'm more just checking in. Well, I think that next week we have already something planned, which is the community workshop. Oh, okay. I don't remember. <laughs> I have to check. Uh, but uh, if there's nothing, then I can plan this for next week. Uh, and if we have the community workshop, would, would you be fine to delay uh, the community workshop for one week? Or do you want the other way around? Because I feel like it's it's cool if we if we say some kind of, like we could say that this is some like an end to the conversation of design and philosophy, and then we use the community workshop to say, okay, what would be just the next step, right? Uh, because this is usually what we use the community workshop to to. That's actually not a bad idea. Let yeah. this yeah. kind of run its course. Let's let's close the loop on it and then decide yeah. the following week what comes next. Okay. okay, okay. Let's do this this way then and see how we can, yeah, maybe how we can extract some kind of uh, not necessarily a, a proper synthesis, but uh, some form of conclusion of all that uh, discussion about design and philosophy. Uh, and it would be nice. I, I would would find it nice if we could. If we could find some, like some, take some time to um, maybe try to, um, yeah, write down something that goes into the, the website and say, okay, what we learned actually during this exploration, uh, uh, explorative di discussions about, um, about design and philosophy, and uh, how could it is, yeah, inform our, our practice. Right. Because I feel like it's the end goal. <laughs> that yeah, it's yeah. useful for, it's for, for people at the end, right? Yeah. Uh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, it's set up. Then I, I will plan all this in the, the meetup. And uh, um, yeah, thank you very much for, for your time. I, I have to go. Uh, I have to go back home. But uh, if you want to end the conversation, I don't know if you want to, to say anything, like don't hesitate. Uh, I've got to jump out too, but it was a really interesting conversation. I really like listening in. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll see you guys next time. Yeah, yeah we'll see you around. I'm going to take off as well. <laughs>